Welcome back to the Metric Stack Podcast. Today, we're joined by Dan Belkowski, founder of Product Tranquility, an expert on B2B SaaS pricing and packaging. Prior to founding Product Tranquility, he did a lot of things, but the coolest, we think, was his solo round-the-world expedition to over 21 countries. Today, we're going to dive into the concept of willingness to pay. I'm joined by my colleague, Lauren Thibodeau, and my name is Alan Ville. Dan, thanks for uh, joining us on the show. Glad to be here, Alan and Lauren. Thank you for having me. Hopefully, this conversation is useful for your listeners. Well, I'm sure it will be, Dan, and, and thrilled you're here. Before we dive in, can you just set the stage for us a little bit? What business objective or context should we be thinking about here? Yeah, well, most SaaS companies I found are focused primarily on acquisition to grow their businesses. You know, there's really only three ways to grow a SaaS business. There's acquisition, monetization, and retention. And I think most folks entirely ignore monetization. I would even say until the recent downturn in the market, probably retention as well. So really what we're tr trying to figure out with pricing is, you know, what are you trying to achieve? Is that a revenue number? Is that profit? Is that gross margin, market share, average revenue per user or per account, customer lifetime value? So there's many impacts that pricing monetization have on your business. And, and maybe we can define the metric that we're talking about today. So we're, we are talking about willingness to pay. How would you define that today? What do you mean by that? Yeah, it's a great question. I think people often throw around the term willingness to pay as having some universal meaning. So it's often referred to as a reservation price. And there's several working definitions. So it could be the, you know, the price at which a consumer will demand one unit of a product, which might be considered a floor. It could be the price at which a buyer is indifferent between buying and not buying, which would be like the indifference price. It could be the minimum price at which a buyer will no longer purchase. It would be a ceiling. So I would say generally, right? one, we should understand what question we're asking uh, or what we're, what we're, we're trying to get to when we uh, use the term. But my general advice is that you should consider customer links to pay as a range, but even for everyday purchases. Uh, depending upon how you ask a question, customers might pick any number of points uh, when asked about willingness to pay. And this situation can be problematic when you know you want a point and customers give you a range, right? So you should always be thinking about it in terms of a range. Awesome. That, that's really helpful. So you've, you've showed maybe one thing that people can get wrong about thinking about this concept, but what else do people get wrong about pricing? Yeah, there's so many to list. You know, <laughs> What I find most is when it comes to SaaS pricing, and most executives think that what you charge determines your success. In fact, who and how you charge determines your success. So I, I, not, I say that not to discount this conversation about willingness to pay. I'm actually really excited to talk about willingness to pay, but I think it gets an over uh, emphasis when it comes to the idea of monetization. You know, understanding really the customers that we're trying to target, you know, what are their particular value drivers, their context, their constraints, what they're trying to get done. So it'll ultimately determine the value they're going to get. And then how do we, how do we actually charge all the elements of SaaS packaging, uh, whether that's your price metric, your pricing model, uh, your offer configurations or bundles, your price structures or fences. Uh, those are very important, you know, because those help solidify your value story make it easy for your go-to-market teams to communicate that value story. Uh, and if you're in a B2B market, even if we set the price appropriate range, we still generally have deal-to-deal -deal discounting, et cetera, that can help us you know, iterate to that particular buyer's uh, overall willingness to pay. Dan, I mean, it, it's almost like there's a, a bit of a black art uh, behind this, right? And I'm picturing when you said that there's a willingness to pay, there's an upper, there's a sort of mid-range, and then there's sort of a, a floor. Um, I was thinking of the salesperson who goes, you know, traditionally, they, they go to visit the customer, they have the conversations, they understand who the customer is, and they sort of figure out what the value driver is and how much they're actually willing to pay, right? Um, have we lost, have, have, SaaS companies lost something in that process as they've made their pricing more transparent. So there's a, there's a bunch in what you just talked about there. So I'd say in one level, you know, your sales team should generally not be going out determining list prices on a deal by deal basis. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking about this is like a hundred a hundred years ago, right? Like when software was brand new, right? <laughs> I mean, there are companies that definitely operate that way today. So I'm not going to say it doesn't ever happen, uh, but generally, right the the company as a core part of its go-to-market strategy 
should be setting sort of overall list prices. Um, and then I forgot the second part of your question. Uh, it was, uh, ha have we lost something? Have we lost something in the way companies now have this published price, you know, and we can't properly segment and we can't really figure out who are we selling it to? Can you, can we offer different prices to different segments? Yeah. So, you know, this goes to, I think, a, a broader topic, which gets uh, get asked about quite frequently, which is, you know, should companies publish their pricing and packaging on their website? And there's really sort of three models that uh, you follow, uh, depending upon the situation that your company is in. So the first is fully transparent uh, public pricing and packaging. This is really good for you know, especially high volume uh, type businesses, so product-led growth type models. Uh, you could almost think of it as a qualification mechanism. If you're uh, selling to a very broad horizontal market, uh, it costs salesperson time to have the same exact pricing conversation with every single customer. Uh, and also, you know, if customers are absolutely you know, out of your market in terms of your willingness to pay or their willingness to pay is is far off, right? You don't want to have to waste uh, sales and marketing time talking to those uh, particular prospects. Uh, I would say the second model is the opposite of that, which is no public pricing and packaging. Uh, those tend to be more suited for if you have a small addressable market, say I'm only selling to the Fortune 100 uh, or you know whatever uh, small sort of vertical type segment, right? And there's high differences in willingness to pay between uh, customers. Then the middle is uh, or the, the other. The other option there is uh, other area there where it's useful is if your your bundles, your offer configurations. Your most SaaS companies right use offer configurations, right? That's how you group together sets of features, functionality. Most SaaS companies will have like a good, better, best set offering, but it's not the only one. I use offer configurations because some people refer to that as tiers and tiers implies good, better, best. It's not the only way or necessarily the best way, depending upon what your situation is. You know, the offer configurations you have are so complicated. They need a salesperson to walk a prospect through, right? Just having that publicly available isn't going to help you, right? It's just going to make your prospects confused. Um, and then there's sort of a middle uh, approach where maybe you publish your packaging, but not your pricing. Um, and again, that's that would be good if, again, you have maybe a small market or high differences in willingness to pay between customer segments. Uh, but then you know, maybe you have a easily uh, understandable uh, uh, packaging uh, offer configurations that customers can understand, and that can help support your sort of value proposition. And so you see these, and there's obviously different iterations. Many companies, even with public pricing and packaging, for example, they may have a, a starter, a premium, a pro, and an enterprise, you know, call us, right, for a quote. Uh, so you see all mixes between, but those are generally the three uh, that uh, map to the, the broadest number of, of companies that we see in the market today. Awesome. Yeah, that's a helpful breakdown, Dan. Um, my jaw hit the floor this week when I looked at a LinkedIn post that said Digital Ocean increased its revenue by $13 million in the quarter just by changing its pricing. And so my question is, wow, how do you know if your pricing is working or not, or if it's optimized or you're leaving money on the table? How do you know? Yeah, it's a great question. And you know, the price controlling function, I would say one of my challenges running my business is that your pricing is not consistently owned. So generally, I'll just talk about a price controlling function because that might be the CEO, that might be uh, the chief marketing officer, chief product officer, finance, uh, sales. And I have opinions on who should own it, but you know, it generally it depends on uh, the situation. You know, or the overall question. You know, if I was talking to a CEO, it'd be I'd ask him a couple questions. One, one, are they meeting their goals? Is pricing getting in the way of those goals? You know, if you have planned list prices and volumes, you know, were those planned prices and volumes achieved? You know, what? How large are the deviations between your list and transaction prices? And do you have? logical explanations for that differential. Uh, you, if you, for example, just implemented a planned price increase, uh, was that successful? Uh, if so, you know, why or why not? Um, and you know, are you losing deals? You know, and has price playing a role uh, in that or are there other factors at play? Uh, are discounts achieving their desired effects? You know, are we discounting more than expected or in a way that aligns with our overall strategy and objectives? Um, or is the organizational friction uh, that pricing is causing between you know operating units, between market segments, between countries? So those would be some of the high level sort of executive questions I'd be looking at. 
Um, and you know, overall, what I'd say is you want to make sure that your price maximizes your long-term profitability. Out long-term, uh, <laughs> could be very different. If you're a startup with uh, two months of cash burn, uh, your your long-term might be the two months. Uh, if you're a you know, big Fortune 500 company, that long-term might be the next ten years, right? And you'll see very different strategies uh, applied by companies that you know with those different planning timeframes. Um, and ultimately, an effective price you know, helps you capture fair value for the. Uh, value that you create for customers. And so are you, do you currently feel like you're doing that? Let me ask you a question that we've often uh, struggled with as well. Oftentimes you have your pricing meetings and you go through the the series of alignment questions and value questions that, you know, some of the things that you've just mentioned, which is great. How, how much does competitive pricing points or competitive pricing models, how much does that sort of influence either our own pricing model or price points and the willingness to pay of our customers who are obviously looking at a number of different competitors. Yeah. So, so competition is definitely an in major input to the, my, the way I look at pricing. So we haven't really talked about my overall sort of view of, of SaaS pricing and packaging, but there's, I have a model called the services model for SaaS pricing. Uh, services is SVCS, which so stands for the four components. So it's your customer segments, segments, uh, value, competition, and strategy. Now it depends. All of the you know your customer segments, the value you create for those segments, the competitive alternatives that are available are all really important inputs to the process. Uh, you know how much we rely on any one of those often is dictated by what I call your pricing orientation. So I sometimes we refer to this as the three C's of pricing. So that could be uh, cost-based pricing, competition-based pricing, customer value-based pricing, often just termed value-based pricing. But marketers, we love our four Ps and our three Cs, <laughs> et cetera. So if we called it two Cs and a V, then it wouldn't be as as, as kitschy. Right? Uh, <laughs> so you know, if you're doing cost-based pricing, right? It's like, what is my cost of goods sold? I have some uh, markup that I'd like to achieve. Let's say I want an eighty percent gross margin. Right. I'm not looking at competition at all. I'm not looking at customer willingness to pay at all. I'm not looking at customer value creation. Um, you know, and there's nothing necessarily inherently wrong with uh, cost based pricing. Uh, I would say all of these we should look at as sort of a ladder. It's a it's a way to progress as you get more and more advanced. Um, and you need to go along this path. You can't just sort of be like, well, we're just going to be value based pricing. I've had those conversations with clients where. They're like, they want to be value-based pricing. And I was like, all right, what is your cost to serve on a marginal basis? And they're like, well, we don't track that. I'm like, well, okay, you need, you, <laughs> we need to know what's driving uh, cost of goods sold. You know, We need to make sure that you can keep the lights on. Otherwise, your unit economics are upside down. You're not going to be in business very long. Um, but when it comes to something like competition-based pricing, right? I might sort of broadly look at the market. Let's say we're in the CRM market. So I'm competing at Salesforce. Uh, they're generally looked at as the leader, the pre, you know, the most premium option, right? And so everyone in that market is generally going to be priced at sort of a discount to uh, Salesforce, for example. Uh, where then I get to maybe a customer value based pricing or value based pricing, you know, I'll look at a, a much deeper level of the the type of outcomes that I'm creating for clients, right? And how is that at a very granular level? Uh, more differentiated, right? What is the percentage sort of uh, change in outcomes that customers receive through through my offering versus theirs? So, you know, it's definitely an important input, but it depends upon a lot of these sort of uh, orientations, right? Orientation in the simplest sense is just how is pricing done around here? What are the factors we look at? And you're going to want to always be balancing, you know, what are your costs? What's your customer uh, value create? What are your strategic goals? What are uh, competitors doing and potential competitive responses to any you know, pricing initiative you might have? Okay, love it. Uh, you may have some more acronyms here for us. I'm not sure, Dan, but we like to look at what what does this metric, what does willingness to pay pair well with in terms of other metrics that we should be looking at as we consider pricing effectiveness? Yeah, it, that's a great question and a very deep question. So I think there's a few things that I would want to be looking at. So one would be something like competitive win rate. So this would be like the number of one opportunities divided by the total opportunities by competitor. Uh, mm -hmm. With any metric, right, if we're looking at your know, willingness to pay in general or, you know, any of these follow on metrics, and I'm sure you guys deal with this all the time, your, your data is only as good as your data hygiene. Um, <laughs> and something like competitive win rate can get polluted by data hygiene problems. Uh, you know, sales reps, 
you know, they have a very hard job. I know this uh, very well running, you know, my own business now. I have way more respect for sales folks, but they don't always really or consistently tag competitors in your CRM. Um, and sometimes, you know, prospects won't disclose who else they're evaluating, right? And uh, sometimes, you know, there, maybe there's a, you know, a single uh, field in Salesforce or whatever CRM you're using that says, what is the competitor we lost against? Well, if there were th- four other competitors in the sample and you don't know what the prospect ended up choosing, like, what do you place there? Do you put all of them? Um, so that could be difficult. Also, you know, there's a, a problem with uh, sampling bias and I deal with a lot of sampling bias just generally in, in pricing research, but you win 0% of the deals in which you aren't involved. Uh, and so getting a true sense of, you know, what your competitive win rate can it can be tough uh, from that perspective. Uh, but you know, the other, another metric I might be uh, wanting to look at would be like percent of deals lost to pricing. Again, this can also suffer from data hygiene problems. You know, the uh, this not so much on the on the rep side, but you know, it's very easy, probably the easiest thing for a prospect to tell a sales rep is your price is too high when they want them to go away. Like I don't want you to talk anymore, right? Um and so what we find is that you know, first of all, you should be tracking the win loss codes, but they should not be thought of as ground truth. In general, uh, we want to make sure that you know we are tracking price, uh, but we find if we go do in depth sort of win loss that you know price tends to be the highest tagged you know loss uh, loss code. Uh, but that you know if you go actually interview those people, there's a lot of other reasons why they didn't uh, choose to buy it, and price probably wasn't the primary one. Um, a general good rule of thumb, you know, we were talking about benchmarks uh, earlier before we got on the call. I think a good rule of thumb, I think Kyle Poyer had put this in uh, from OpenView, had put this in one of his uh, posts. But he said a good rule of thumb is that priced well, you know, you should lose about a third of your deals based upon pricing. Um, it's it's a difficult thing, especially in the area I play in, in B2B SaaS, because unlike in uh, B2C, uh, where price is probably the most dominant factor, in B2B, it tends to be somewhere like the third to seventh most important factor. Uh, so you know, while it comes up a lot, you know, while it is important, you know, uh, customers are value conscious. They want to make sure they're getting the most for their money. Uh, oftentimes, they're trying to understand a lot more about your product, right? There's a lot of reputational risk. There's performance risk, uh, you know, et cetera, that, that, that they're looking at as well. Um, and uh, we can go all day. I'll mention one more thing on this is uh, discounting percentage. So you know, this can help inform if your price is uh, too high or too low. Uh, you also may want to slice this by deal size, for example, um, to give you a sense of, uh, you know, are we just? I would say I would say there's a couple of elements here. There's a distinct difference, and I, I didn't used to make this difference, but I've seen enough clients now that I do. Uh, there's a difference between having a discount policy and enforcing a discount policy. Uh, so, you know, when we're looking at discounting, you know, sometimes I come in, it's the wild west. Sometimes it's like, oh, okay, this doesn't match our policy, and so then we have an enforcement issue. You know, maybe it's not a deal desk, or uh, there's not a proper uh, discounting authority uh, systems uh, set up, or, or those are getting gamed, or uh, whatever it might be. But that could also be a, a helpful metric for us to look at. So all of the examples that we've just chatted about, almost all of them are real world examples. They're they're in the wild. You're looking at the the win loss. You're looking at you know data that is actually happening. Um, you know, on an ongoing basis. Is there any way to test this ahead of time? You know, can you, I mean, similar to, you know, an NPS score or similar similar to like the Sean Ellis test where you're asking people, you know, if we took this feature away, you know, how, how frustrated would you be, right? Is there stuff that you can do? And I know pricing is one of these things where customers lie, unless they're actually paying for it, they're, they're not going to tell you the truth. But are there ways to ask these questions before you actually get your prices and product out in the wild. Yeah. So this is a whole bunch of uh, concerns that this brings up. So, you know, if we go back to, I took econ in undergrad and I had to take it again in my, during my MBA program. The idea is ideal is the economists tell us, well, we just line all of our customers up by willingness to pay. We get our demand curve. You know, we we find out where marginal cost equals marginal value or marginal uh, revenue. We set our price right there. Boom. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it rarely works this way. It's, you know, it's incredibly challenging to get an actual demand curve, contrary to what your economics uh, textbooks claim. Uh, definitely not in the B two B SaaS uh, world. When we think about measurement, I think it's important to understand that you know, measurement isn't the elimination of uncertainty, but rather the reduction of uncertainty. 
So you know what determines the value of a measurement is the combination of a high level of uncertainty with a high cost if we're wrong. So let me let me ask you this. Let's play a little example. So so I got I got for those of you listening, I, I'm holding up an algae and water bottle. Uh, uh, Alan, what do you what do you think this water bottle costs? So give me give me a range. Give me like a ninety percent uh, range. Okay, I'm gonna say it's gonna be um, uh, eighteen dollars to twenty five dollars. Okay, do you think that there's a five percent chance that it's higher than twenty five dollars? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what? What? Give me your number so that's higher. That uh, so there's a five percent chance it might be higher. Okay, so I would say twenty nine dollars would be sort of the the max that. All right, yeah. and you said eighteen on the low end. Yeah. All right. What is there a five percent chance you think it could be lower than than eighteen? No, I don't think so. Okay. All right. So you got a range of like eighteen to twenty nine dollars. All right. So let's flip this on its head. So say you were responsible for pricing this water bottle. So like, what is the cost to you in terms of revenue if you price at the low end of the range versus the high end of the range? And assume you're going to be selling thousands of these, right? So when we're thinking about this, the you know end of example, but the the important part is, you know, what is it? What is that? mean in terms of the company impact and like how accurate you know sort of you've got this range of okay we think it's 18 to 29 let's say you know we're thinking about designing this water bottle from scratch right it was it, obviously the water bottles exist but for many of our uh, listeners they're probably you know, dealing with some more market uncertainty you know they're not sure what the willingness to pay of whatever feature or product they're coming up with let's say if you priced it at you know if if the market willingness to pay was anything less than 20 you guys are going to lose your shirt. You're going to go out of business. And so this really helps us frame, you know, how much, how certain do we need to be, right? We don't need to have an exact number. We don't need to know if it's $25.99. We need to know that it's greater than 20 in order to make sure, proceed with all of the you know, development, investment, et cetera. So, you know, understanding this is, is helpful because it helps us avoid blind guessing. You know, we can identify uh, specific purchase or customer context, you know, and the, and the differences between them, you know, how different marketing strategies to influence perceived value can influence uh, willingness to pay uh, and understand how to further develop our products based upon what customers tell us are valuable, right? So, so it's not just the number, right? We're, we're trying to figure out uh, one, you know, is this, is this a worthwhile investment? You know, do we have the confidence we needed in order to not lose our shirts? Uh, and also, how does this influence you know future future investment and other uh, strategies we might uh, put in place, give or or who we might target, right? So you might find out that you know, certain customers in with certain contexts are are more well suited, have higher willingness to pay than others, and just that relative difference is of, is of value to you. So you know, in general, right? We kind of went through a, a little bit of example, right? The the process for researching the you know value of of willingness to pay is right defining a decision problem right we just define a decision problem understand what you know right you you didn't say i don't know it could be could be 0 dollars it could be a billion dollars i have no idea you had some information right and then you know what is the you know cost to go compute that additional information and then what are ident- uh, uh, available relevant uh, measurement instruments we can use to uh, calculate the the uncertainties right and so as we're going through uh, this, right, there's many sort of different techniques and I'm actually in the middle of writing a blog post on this now. So you can cut me short if I go too long, but <laughs> there's, you know, we think of sort of primary market research kind of in qualitative and, and quantitative methods. Um, and so those qualitative methods could be, you know, interviewing customers or prospects directly. It could be using uh, management judgment or expert interviews, right? Co- going and talking to your internal teams, sales, customer uh, success, executives, a feedback from channel partners, a feedback from market experts like external consultants or analysts uh, groups, right? So those, those are kind of your qualitative uh, tools you could use. And then on the quantitative side, you know, there's kind of two broad categories we call in the in the world of research, revealed preference data and stated preference. So revealed preference would be your historical market data, uh, you know, potentially uh, experiments. Uh, generally, I would say experiments not relevant for SaaS, like A/B testing, uh, bad for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, but we, could, which we could circle back on if you're interested. But um, and then stated preference. So those would be things like uh, direct or indirect surveys. So uh, direct type questioning methods might be what we call like there's a Van Westendorp. It's named after a Dutch economist uh, back, who developed the method back in the 70s. 
Uh, there's there's others uh, indirect, which would be things like uh, conjoint studies or uh, discrete choice studies, uh, et cetera, that we can we can leverage, right? And, and all of that's going to depend, and which tool we use is depend upon, you know, what is our sort of level of certainty? What do we think we know? You know what is the level of precision? You know, what's applicable to our particular situation? Awesome. So we're gathering all this data to figure out what price we should use. And I want to pick up on something you said earlier, that you have a point of view on who should make the ultimate decision. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Armed with all this data, who should be making the final decision on price? Yeah. So look, the founders in an early stage usually own pricing because there's just nowhere else to do it. And I feel like too often that sort of as you know, founders, scale teams, there's no real thought because price doesn't change. Most people don't change price that often. Uh, unlike, hey, I need someone to come in and do customer support, or I need someone to come in and actually write the code for the product. Uh, pricing is one of these things that sort of lingers with founders or CEOs for for much too long. I would say in in more established companies, you know, product marketing I think is best suited to own pricing um, and. I spent a lot of my career in product management, product strategy. If we think about you know the role of product managers, uh, they are sort of the walking embodiment of the product. Uh, there's not really an equivalent right now for the pricing world, and so you know until that happens, what I'd say is product marketing should be the leader of pricing, but they should execute that via leadership of like a pricing committee or a pricing council. Uh, pricing is very cross functional, and everyone. You know, for, for better or worse, right? Everyone feels like they're an expert in pricing at the executive table, uh, and so it's best to bring those people in early uh, and have a rational, codified uh, process that you go through. Uh, it, you do not want to be in a situation where, hey, we've got this six-figure deal on the line at the end of the quarter. Like, let's just do this thing, you know, because nobody's made a decision. Or, or hey, the last three calls the sales team was on, people said the price was too high. It means we need to all lower our prices. So you want to have when uh, better spirits prevail in a rational environment where there's not a direct decision on the line, you want to have thought through, okay, how do we want to handle this? And you want to make sure there's someone with the decision authority you know, at the top. And I think speaking about product marketing uh, specifically, I think they're closest to the customer regarding deep customer insights. I would say you know, both them and product management. Uh, but uh, it Look, I, I would say this too. I, I came out of the world of product management. I think product management, you know, is well suited to do it. They really understand what customers need, how the product drives value. But what I've seen is, is chief product officers generally have way too much on their plate, almost like the CEO, to give it the the rigor and the time that it, it requires. Um, and so, you know, product marketing, they have that strategic marketing lens. They understand the customer segments, the overall company uh, position, um, and they are, you know. Usually have a good sense of you know the co the competitive space, how messaging uh, re their control of uh, usually the messaging and all of those things are wrapped up in the pricing function, right? So your 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 pricing is a function of your positioning, and and so if product marketing owns the company positioning, you know at least you know they're the keepers of it. Maybe you know, obviously it's a collaborative exercise. You know, they're best suited to, to own it going forward. Dan, this has been truly amazing. Everybody, Dan Belkowski, founder of Product Tranquility. I think we've learned a lot of things today about understanding cost value and competition pricing, understanding that obviously there are uncertainties, but being deliberate about how you define your pricing model, who you go after, and then obviously segmenting and learning from that data. Once again, Dan, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Laura and Alan. I appreciate the conversation and the questions. Well, thank you so much. Pleasure. If you enjoyed today's conversation about metrics and data, be sure to check out Metric HQ our online resource for the metrics that matter most to you and your business.